it's a very relaxed uh, hour or so. My only fear is that you haven't eaten. Have you eaten? You have. Oh, you have. <laughs> You're smart. No one, you haven't eaten? You've eaten. You haven't. Because there's nothing worse than playing to a hungry audience. <laughs> Isn't it? I said to my beloved God brother, Shama Sundar Prabhu, God, I hope we don't go out there like Heckle and Jekyll. Heckle and Jekyll are American two cartoon crows. Heckle and Jekyll. And he said, why not? Why shouldn't we be like Heckle and Jekyll? <laughs> well, first I should probably mention that we have the honor of uh, our, my good God brother's uh, presence here because uh, of Govinda's restaurant. <laughs> Yesterday, or day before, when he first arrived, we were sitting in the restaurant and he made the terms. He said, unless I get french fries, I'm not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Two big heaping bowls later, he agreed to speak today. <laughs> So, we've been asked to speak something on Srila Prabhupada, a great and wonderful personality, especially of the Kali Yuga. Uh, uh, what is the word? Second in line after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, comes Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard a class where Prabhupada said that Krishna is the sun and all the living entities are the sunshine, sun particles. But the problem is there's a cloud. So I was telling Shama Sundar Prabhu that when I spoke in Mayapur and Prabhupada's disappearance day, I spoke only very briefly this time. I said, to be in Prabhupada's presence was like the sun, Krishna, and the sun particle was Prabhupada with no cloud. Mm. There was no cloud. Mm. Nothing interfered. So everything was brilliant and sweet. I remember in Nairobi, I had an infected knee, and Prabhupada, I came from the doctor, and Prabhupada was in the backyard of that house. And he said, come, Bhavanan, sit here in the sweet Nairobi sun. Mm. Mm. So I sat right down next to him. Next thing I knew, I was sound asleep on the grass. Prabhupada was gone. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you know, come sit here. Sweet, it was sweet. Uh. The sweet Nairobi sun. Uh. So when you have Krishna and Krishna's representative without any maya, so there's no maya. So it's all very sweet. And he acts as the indicator of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Shama Sundar said, uh, Prabhu said the other day, if Prabhupada is so beautiful, how beautiful must Krishna be? Mm -hmm. So I'll start, out, I'll start out the proceedings. Okay. I, want, I want to pick up on your movie theme. Oh, okay. I don't know if you've mentioned this in your book, but in Nairobi in 1971, on Diwali, the next day we were all flying off to Bombay. It was Bombay at that time. So Shama Sundar Prabhu was talking about making movies about Krishna. Did you mention this in your book? No. Because uh, I was envious of you. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. So Prabhupada said, yes, we will make a movie of the uh, Mahabharat. And then Prabhupada started casting it. He <laughs> said, Brahmanand will be Bhima. <laughs> and this is where I got envious. He said, Shama Sunda will be Arjun. Oh! <laughs> I wanted to be Arjun. That. 
<laughs> and he said, Gargamuni. Gargamuni has this, one eye looks one way, one eye looks another way. Right? He said, Gargamuni will be the crooked-minded uncle Sakuni. <laughs> So I said, Prabhupada, what will I be? He said, you will be my assistant, and I will direct every scene. And then he said the most far out thing, and I just have to, before I tell you what he said, I was involved in the 60s with what they call underground films. It was all just nonsense. But we had put a camera on the top of Lord and Taylor department store and we aimed it at the Empire State Building. And we kept the camera rolling for 24 hours. It was called Empire. <laughs> so the sun came up and went across, and maybe a bird flew by. <laughs> Night came, the lights came on, and then the sun came up, the lights went off. And we showed it in a little cinema on 6th Avenue by the, between 41st and 42nd Street. It was an Andy Warhol film. And you could go, it was on 24 hours a day. You could go any time of the day and not see the Empire State. I don't know why you'd have to go there. You could just go out in the street and look up and see it. Did you have to pay? To yeah, yeah, to yeah pay. of course. A anything to do with Andy, you had to pay. So. That was considered very groundbreaking, avant-garde, a 24-hour film. So Prabhupada said, yes, you will be my assistant, and I will direct every scene, and it will be 18 days long. <laughs> so one day for every day of the Battle of Kurukshetra. Oh. So that's Prabhupada. <laughs> An 18-day-long film. <laughs> Over to you. Okay. Well, you were talking, you started out talking about the specialness of Srila Prabhupada, second in line to Lord Chaitanya. And you remember our godbrother Pajumna? Yeah. Yeah. I keep in touch with him over the years. He's gone on, he was Prabhupada's uh, Sanskrit editor for many years. He traveled maybe more than anyone else with yeah. Prabhupada, any single devotee. So I like to keep in touch with him. He remembers so much. Over, he went into a career. Do you know what his career was? He, he worked for the United Nations in New York for decades as their correspondent, uh, the head of a, a section of ecumenical conferences. And his job was to go around the world and interview sadhus, gurus of every denomination. That's what he did 10, 12 months a year, travel around the world and interview holy people to put on these ecumenical conferences. So I asked him, well, Pradyumna, in all those years, how many Prabhupads are there out there? How many have you seen? And he rolled his eyes back in his head and said, no one even comes close. And that was Dalai Lama everybody he met. Uh. So ecumenical brings yeah. up a story. They wanted Prabhupada to speak at an ecumenical thing. Prabhupada was not, he was not very enthusiastic for, he said, yes, I will speak. This is ecumenicalism. One God, Krishna. <laughs> One book, Bhagavad Gita. One flag, Ishkan. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. Okay. Well, you know, did, Prabhupada, of course, was the hard, a hardball hitter always in these kind of situations. But he had every every aspect of his personality was always there as well. As far as and I remember mo almost more than anything else his sense of humor. I mean, Prabhupada, if I recently have looked at a lot of photos from those days, and in most photos where I'm standing somewhere in the crowd. I'm laughing because Prabhupada, everything he did cracked me up. I could see it from a certain kind of point of view where he was really just acting, a, playing with the world. He was so detached from it all, but he played the role to the hilt, whatever it was. He was the action hero. He was the, the sentimentalist. 
He was uh, the soft guy, the hard guy. Whatever it took for the time, place, and circumstance, Prabhupada was perfect. So, sense of humor. The sense of humor. So, th this, of course, everyone here has heard this joke. This is the first time I heard Prabhupada told a joke. It was in 1970 in Los Angeles Temple. He was giving class and he said, uh, he was talking about the power of association. Mm -hmm. So he said, in India, it is very common, people pass stool in the fields. So he said, this man went into the field and he passed stool. And when he got up, he looked down at the stool with a look of disgust. And the stool looked up at him and said, don't look at me like that. <laughs> Last night I was the most delectable gulab jamun. <laughs> he said, but one night's association with you, I have become this abominable thing. <laughs> A joke. And Prabhupada was very erudite because he was very well educated. Mm. And uh, at another class in that same temple room in Los Angeles, 1970, mm. Prabhupada quoted Shakespeare. I was amazed. Mm. I was amazed. Mm. He was talking about mercy. And suddenly, this is 1970, yeah, 1970, he said, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven. That is from your Shakespeare, he called him, Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice. Yes. So, yeah, I, I recently, you know, I've been part of my research, gone through every conversation that Prabhupada had. And when he was with certain people, he came up with quotes and, and, and uh, uh, you know, like pointing to, to different uh, uh, quotations, things like that, Latin. And one one uh, uh, conversation with some lawyers, he started quoting Latin phrases <laughs> from law books. Hmm. It, what he was constantly a surprise, Srila Prabhupada. You never knew what he was, he was going to say or do. You couldn't predict anything. But it was always wonderful. Hmm. The surprise was always hmm. wonderful. Uh, one one aspect that I started noticing as I was doing this research was, you know, I was his secretary for almost two years, and I I started realizing my role as secretary. I was I was Ed McMahon to his Johnny Carson. <laughs> they don't understand. Johnny Carson is a famous co comedian in America, and he has a straight man who accompanied him on the shows who would laugh at everything he said or react in some way that led him on to the next joke. And in some ways I was that, I played that personality to Prabhupada. He would look at me out of the corner of his eyes after he said some profound thing. And say, like, how did that go over, Shamasundar? How'd you like that? And I, I noticed that happen over those years. I loved that role. Oh. <laughs> you were the secretary. I was always the servant. Uh, <laughs> like Prabhupada said, and don't mind, you know, he said in 1977, Tamal Krishna is my right hand, Bhavananda is my left. <laughs> I like that, I relish that because that's the, this is how I was thinking, don't mind, but that's the hand that you use to do all the dirty work. <laughs> so I like that. And, and uh, Prabhupada always liked my keeping everything clean, so dirty work, so you make things clean. So uh, we were going up the stairs to the roof of the Lotus Building mm. in Mayapur, mm. and Prabhupada said, Bhavanand is the best manager. Mm. All right. <laughs> he keeps everything clean. Then we got up on the roof and he would walk around the roof, the whole group of us. And of course the roof, it's a rectangular building, there's four corners. So in one corner, the wind had blown little twigs and little dust and little pieces of paper. 
Prabhupada was walking around and he stopped. And he pointed at his cane. He said, "Dirt." He, then he looked at me. He said, "This is your management." <laughs> so up and down. <laughs> But you were able to accept that kind of oh, yeah. thing. I mean, I had a little more delicate sensibility. Prabhupada never laid into me. Very. I mean, I can't remember even one occasion where he really l let me down. It would have. I would have crashed and burned had he done so. So, every he treated everyone that way according to their abilities and capacity for anger and. and I never thought of you as delicate. Oh. I <laughs> If Prabhupada would have chastised me that way, dirt, you clean it up, I probably would have just killed myself. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing he said about me, which I loved. Uh. Again, I wasn't on the morning walk. He was walking on the, the road by the front wall in Mayapur. I was back in the, in the building preparing for Prabhupada to come in and give class. And I had, I don't know, I had spent money on something, on something that was too much and not really important. Prabhupada was angry. And he said to uh, everyone, he is simply sitting there in the marble palace spending money like an irresponsible prince. <laughs> Achyutananda came running back, <laughs> big fat Achyutananda, running back. Yo, Prabhupada just said about you. And when he said that, when he told me, I went, Hari Bol, <laughs> he understands me. <laughs> Maybe most of you know, but you may not know that, uh, that Bhavananda was the original innovator of the Mayapur project. Can you tell us? You were telling me that story yesterday, how... Prabhupada gradually got you in to go to Mayapur to a barren rice field with yeah. no, nothing on it and told you to build the biggest temple in, a, in the world. Well, <laughs> you wanted to hear the story of how or yeah. what happened when I got there? No, how. Okay. I had been, I was supposed to become Prabhupada's secretary in 1970 when that big, there was some big to do, but we won't go into that. And uh, Prabhupada's secretary was a, a boy named Devananda. He yeah. was giving him sannyas, and he was supposed to travel with Vishnu Jana. And he said, Bhavananda will be my secretary. So I was all happy. Mm. But then Prabhupada said, no, this Devananda is too weak. He, he has to stay with me. So then I was unhappy. <laughs> so I was praying like anything, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 in the temple. But I was praying with a, a motive, you know, you're not supposed to pray like that, but I always do. <laughs> Prabhupada, please make me a sannyasi also, please make me a sannyasi also. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. You got your wish. I wanted wish. to be a sannyasi. You got your wish. So then, someone comes, comes into the temple room and says, oh, Prabhupada wants to see you. So I go running up the stairs, to his quarters and he says, I want you to go to New York, because New York at that time was 60 to 20, 61 Second Avenue. It was a dump, just a dump on the second floor of the, used to be a tuxedo rental shop. <laughs> oh, it was a dump. And there were nine devotees. <laughs> So he said, I want you to do in New York what you have done here, because I was a member of the executive committee. It was Karanda, Jayananda, Gargamuni, and myself. We were the executive committee. So I want you to make a big temple. So I went to New York, and I rented this double uh, four-story double uh, building, two buildings attached with... Yeah, in Henry Bro Street. In Brooklyn, yeah. In Brooklyn. Yeah. So there a year, and, and uh, shall I tell you how I made all the devotees? I, this is a little if off. If you feel like huh? it. If you feel. I made all the <laughs> devotees because by October of that year, we had 139 devotees. Worldwide. 
<laughs> from nine. <laughs> but this is how I did it. <laughs> Satsvarup was the president of Boston, and he wrote a letter to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, how many chickpeas should we eat? I remember that. Prabhupada said, three or four. I, you know. <laughs> so he started serving the devotees three or four chickpeas. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, Bhagawan Prabhu, he, uh, in Detroit, he wrote to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, how many japatis should we eat? <laughs> Prabhupada said, one, two, like that. <laughs> so the devotees were starving like you, all of you are right now. <laughs> Hungry. So I started making big, for breakfast I made halava, the best halava, butter and, and sugar and dates and and lots of cut fruit, oranges and apples and slowly all the devotees started coming to the New York <laughs> temple. <laughs> the tongue. The tongue is very powerful. <laughs> so anyway, after a year, I said to Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada, I've done what you asked. I'm, I think I'm ready to do something new for you now. So, uh, there was, I won't go into that. I should know. But at the airport, he was leaving for London. He called me over. He said, I will write you from, from uh, a London what I want you to do. So a week later, I got a telegram. I want you to come immediately to Bury Place and I want you to take charge of our new world headquarters at Sridham Mayapur. I said, wow! India, because I always wanted to go to India. I remember as a little boy on the front page of the New York News, the morning newspaper, the cremation of Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. And I said, wow, that was... Something, yeah, you know, I was fascinated. Elephants and everything. Huh? Elephants and flowers. No, f smoke. Smoke. And ah. crowds of people <laughs> at the, where they, so, <laughs> then I said to a devotee, this is how ignorant we were and how fortunate all of you are, actually. <laughs> I said to a devotee who was sitting there, I said, what is Sridham Mayapur? <laughs> I, I loved it, I wanted to go. But what is it? What is it? Yeah, yeah, nobody knew. And someone said, I think that's where Lord Chaitanya was born. I said, really? We had stacks of teachings of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> <laughs> we distributed them, but we never read we them. We sold them. Yeah, that's all we did is sell them. Huh? That's all we did is sell them. Yeah, yeah all we printed. did is sell them. Never read them. <laughs> anyway. So within a week after that, I was in Bury Place. <laughs> and every morning, we go into Prabhupada's room. What was his name? Ranchor? R Rochan. No, Ranchor. Ranchor. Ranchor and Narayan. And Narayan and I. Yeah. And Prabhupada would describe what he wanted, a temple with a big dome. And Ranchor made a kind of like a pagoda thing. Well, big. we would go on those morning walks around London, and he would point to his cane, how tall he wanted to. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember one morning walk in Russell Square where he, there was a big hotel, a Victorian 10-story, something like that, hotel across the street, Hotel Russell, I think. And he said, ha, he asked Ranchor, how tall is that building? And Ranchor couldn't tell him. He asked Narayan, how tall is that building? And nobody could answer. Everybody guessed, 80 feet, 100 feet? 60 feet, and Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, it is 110 feet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 10. 110, 110 feet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we went to uh, uh, Westminster Abbey. Remember that? We, yeah, I do. The, it was a study, a study uh, uh, tour. Prabhupada wanted to show us how to build Mayapur from the example of Westminster Abbey. And we spent the whole afternoon there walking and, around. And he spoke how how they're great heroes, they put them in the, they bury them in Westminster <laughs> yes, Abbey, <I'm laughs> and everyone's walking on there over them. He said, just see, I'm walking on Charles Darwin. 
<laughs> so Prabhupada invited the chairman, I think it was Larson and Tubro, yeah. big engineering firm who had a big uh, branch here in India during, uh, the, well they're still here, but they were very big during the colonial times. So the chairman of Larson and Tubro came to Berry Place, he was an Englishman, very conservative, double-breasted suit, pinstripe flannel, you know that. <laughs> and uh, they were discussing, Prabhupada and he were discussing what kind of foundation for the temple on the Gangetic Plain, where Mayapur is on the... And Prabhupada said, I think a raft foundation is best. And he said, yes, uh, the man said, I think that, that is it. So that was it, and then the man left. And uh, when we engineered the TOVP foundation, it's a raft foundation. Mm. It kind of like floats. Mm. Because you were telling me the bedrock is how far down? Well, in the Gangetic Plain, it's several kilometers to, de to bedrock. To bedrock. Yeah. Everything else is just silt and, and sand, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Prabhupada knew everything. He knew everything, yeah. far in advance. And, and many of it, many times when he would point at a place like Mayapur and say these things, we're going to build a huge thing, we doubted that. You know, why, Prabhupada, why would anybody come way out here in this godforsaken place and, and you know how you know we had, he said build two thousand rooms. Who's going to come there? <laughs> the same happened in Juhu. It was just rice paddies, palm palm orchards between Bombay and uh, Juhu. There, there was, was nothing. nothing. It was beautiful, but there was no people. There were no people. Just local villagers. So we, Prabhupada says, I want this property. This is perfect. Build our center here. We said, Wow. We would talk to them all. I don't think anybody's going to go out there. Prabhupada's making a mistake here. <laughs> oh, even Raman Reti, we thought in those days in well, Daban that that's too far. At, at that time, if you, uh, Tamal and I went to, from Bombay to Brindaban, mm. and uh, Guru Das and Jamuna were staying on the, the, the rooms above Prabhupada's rooms uh. at Radhadamadar. Uh. So, Prabhupada said, anyone who stays here, every day you have to take part in a kirtan and go out to Raman Reti, out to the... <laughs> That's yeah. right. I remember. So, I, all right. So we went along to Jamuna, Guru Das, Tamal, and me. The town of Vrindavan is far away. You know, out, out the outs, go out of town. We're going down this road. There's just far. And I said to Tamal, Who's going to come all the way out here to a temple? <laughs> Said the same thing. Yeah. Who's going to come out? Prabhupada so knew. far away from Vrindavan town. Yeah. Now the whole town of Vrindavan has moved to Raman Reti. But he planted that seed in us that nothing is impossible. And with that attitude, we, we accepted everything he said. Oh, and we accepted we everything. Out, we went out and did Whether things. we doubted or not, yeah, didn't matter. It didn't matter. And in some ways, well, Prabhupada was the, exa the living example of that type of risk and adventure. We saw in him someone who, like a, almost like a, uh, an explorer, an adventurer in the wilderness. He was all alone, the only Indian man we'd ever seen. Here he was at a, as an old man. That's true. He was yeah. a, the he first, was Indian. first Indian. Well, no, the, there was another Indian, Sabu. <laughs> in New York, star. maybe. No, Sabu. The Elephant Boy. He was in oh. the movie The Elephant Boy oh, right. in the 40s. But he was, I think, from Sri Lanka. <laughs> but, you know, you never saw. No, and in the, even in the old black and white movies, if they had to have an Indian person, it was just a white guy with... Tyrone Power. Tyrone Power. Tyrone Power. With, with, with his the, hair dyed black. Yeah. <laughs> but we all, we all had this wonderful... Uh, appreciation of things from India. It was beginning to come into our lives. The word yoga, all of these concepts from, these books were written, uh, Alan Watts's book on, on meditation and so on, and we were beginning to think, wow, it must, the answer must lie in the East. 
And then Prabhupada came to us, came to us through this very foreign window. So, and his example as a, as, as, as a risk taker and adventurer caught us right where we wanted to be. It just, he just could take us anywhere and say, do anything, and we would do it. There was he, he taught us many Indian terms. <laughs> Halava, <laughs> Pakuras, <laughs> Samosa, <laughs> Chapatis, <laughs> all wonderful things. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> was sitting there, and Prabhupada kept going huh, like this. Doing with his head, I'd never seen anyone do that. Huh, huh, huh. Of course, it's very common, you know. But I'd never said, "What's he doing with his head? What does that mean?" And then when he drank water from the lota, and it went mm, perfect, spout right in. Not, it didn't spill a drop. Who drinks water like that? Who, who drinks water? <laughs> And then his accent was a little difficult at first. Yes. Uh, he had just come to America and started speaking English full time. So he was learning English at the same time we were learning him. And uh, when Malati and I got married in the temple, about two weeks after Prabhupada arrived in San Francisco, at one point in this fire ceremony, we, he had asked us to bring wood, so we brought or, broken up orange crates, so all the wood we had. And uh, we, he said, build a fire. Well, we didn't really know what he meant by that, so we built a bonfire, a big fire, <laughs> in this little tiny build, uh, room, storefront. And it became filled with smoke. Everybody's tears were running down everybody's face. Even Prabhupada had tears coming down his eyes. The Swami. He wasn't Prabhupada yet. He was the Swami. And those who really knew him, he was Swami G. And that was when you became on the inside with Prabhupada. You could say Swami G. And uh, at one point, we didn't know what to do. Somebody told us we had to tie the sari to the my shirt. She, my wife had to tie her sari to my shirt. So we did that. And uh, then he, he said, uh, throw the rice in the fire, but we didn't understand what he said. Throw your wife. So we started throwing the rice at him. Uh. <laughs> I was covered with this white rice. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, now, he chanted some mantras, and then he said, now bow, bow down. And we didn't c catch what he said. Haridas thought he heard him say, oh, I think I know what he said. He got down on his hands and he started blowing into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all started blowing into the fire. The smoke's going in Prabhupada's face. <laughs> what he tolerated. Oh, oh, we were just crude when, barbarians. When I got initiated, mm. we used to go up to, on Sunday, we used to go up to uh, Griffith Park mm. and chant, and there were all the hippies were there and everything. And what were those people called? Green, green brothers or green? They distributed food and. Okay, it was in L.A. thing. Huh? L.A. Thing. In L.A. No, I didn't know that. So, and we handed out cards. Everyone come to the fee. We're having a whole big initiation, fire sacrifice. And, so we didn't know that these green people were handing out punch that was filled with LSD. <laughs> oh, right. We didn't take any. But everyone who came to the temple was high on LSD, and they were crawling in and out of the windows. And <laughs> Prabhupada just sat there and chanted on each person's bees and handed. And they were coming. and and. and <laughs> and then Prabhupada got up and left. And then no sooner had he left than the door to the temple room opened and this <laughs> naked girl came running in. She wanted to dance in front of Jagannath. She was dancing around, <laughs> totally naked. <laughs> totally naked. So they throw a, a towel around her, take her out, 
Then the door, another door opens, and a guy runs in totally. <laughs> <laughs> and he well, later became a devotee, <laughs> yeah. um, Madhavananda. Oh, Madhavananda. I still see him once They shaved him up, and he had a bright red hair, and it was all curly, and he had this big, like a big spring. Mohanananda. <laughs> Mohanananda. Uh, Mohanananda. 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 Yeah. 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 Wild, it, wild times. Well, people can't imagine now what Haight Ashbury District was like in San Francisco in 1967 when Prabhupada came there. There were a hundred thousand young people who were the only citizens of this district. Everyone was a young hippie, thousands. And, and they had just been given the license to do anything they wanted. So everyone was, you know, acting out their fantasies. And we'd had, we didn't have much much idea yet what Prabhupada wanted to do, but he, we knew he liked programs outside the temple sometimes, so we would make arrangements for him to travel someplace to talk. And one of the places nearby the temple, a couple blocks away, was the psychedelic shop. It was the first uh, kind of head shop in, in, a, in San Francisco where all the hippies hung out. And there was a little room in back called the meditation room where most of the LSD people hung out. And, and uh, hallucinated in that little room. So we made an arrangement for Prabhupada to speak at the, at the psychedelic shop one, one evening. And as we walked up through this horde, this crowd, he, first time he'd been out on the streets, we walked there, three or four blocks. Thousands of these hippies doing these crazy things. I was quite alarmed that we were, pres that we were exposing him to this. And as we walked along, I said, Prabhupada, uh, sorry about all this, you know, kind of apologizing for it. He said, never mind, I'm an old Calcutta man. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. yes. When I got to Calcutta, I understood that. You understood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prabhupada had a great sense of style. Yes. I uh, never seen anyone so elegant in just a saffron lungi and mm. a, the way he would throw his chudder i i was fascinated by mm. chudders i thought wow what is this garment you know <laughs> sometimes over his head and around and all purpose garment carry carry stuff in it yeah, yeah. it was amazing <laughs> uh when uh Karanda and J Jayananda and I built Prabhupada's quarters first at, at uh, Watsika Avenue Temple, which, gar which was an old church that Gargamuni had bought with Spiritual Sky mm. backing. So we made a nice uh, sitting room, what you call darshan room now. And a, he had a nice bedroom, and one one room, we said, what room should we make this property? He said, a library. He said, every gentleman has a library. <laughs> so anyway, I was, I bought, we didn't really understand, you know, like opulence. You know, everyone talks about opulence, big beds, and, you know, oh, lavish, opulence. Lavish. Well, we didn't think of Prabhupada in those when we, I bought him a bed, it was just a single bed, you know, it was nothing. But anyway, in America, and I'm sure in England, and are you from Scotland? Huh? England. England. Where? England. England, oh, okay. You straightened out your bill last night? I've never seen so much to do over paying who's going to pay what, but anyway. I thought you must be Scotch, <laughs> a Scotty. He's North England. That's uh, pretty close. To say, yeah. So <laughs> normally you put the head of the bed against a wall, right? And it comes out from the wall. Prabhupada walked in. He said, no, no. Uh, uh, put it in the middle of the room. I said, in the middle of the room, Prabhupada, really? He said, yes. So we had a rug. It was like a phony Indian Afghani rug. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada said, put this in the middle of the floor and then put the bed in the middle of the rug. He said, but before you do that, he said, I want the rug covered with sheets 
He said, sheets, Prabhupada. White sheets? He said, yes. So I had one of our Brahmacharini, she sewed together all this sheeting material. And Prabhupada said, now, he took one side, I took the other side, and we shook it like that, and then it settled over the rug. And then he said, now get rid of the wrinkles, you know, the... Mm. So I got down on my hands and knees, and I was straightening like that, and I feel someone bump into me, and Prabhupada's right on his hands and knees next to me, straightening out the... And then he looks at me like this, and he said, again, something new I have introduced in America. He said, sheets on rugs. <laughs> and then we tucked it under, underneath, you know, the edge and put the bed in the middle. Everything was new to yeah, us. Yeah, everything, everything Prabhupada wonderful. did. It was wonderful. And it, it became our habit immediately. Whatever Prabhupada did, we followed that example completely. Now, as an old Calcutta man yourself, Prabhupada, did you have a chance to see where Prabhupada went to school at the Scottish Teachers yeah, College we visited and all there. that stuff? We wow. visited with Prabhupada. What? It's all very colonial, you know? Yeah. But uh, in 1971, uh, Calcutta was quite nice. Nothing like it is today, you know, but it was quite nice. It still had a vestige of the old colonial times of beautiful estates, lady and lord, lord and lady Mukherjee's big estate was around the corner from our Albert Road temple and the streets were clean and it was rather peaceful uh, and not so crowded. And that That was not until the Bangladesh War, when all the uh, Bangladesh Refugee. refugees came flooding over the border and they all parked themselves on the sidewalks in Calcutta and they'd never moved. <laughs> so, you know, but it was quite nice, Calcutta at that time. And we went to... Um, uh, his birthplace. You can, huh? His birthplace. His birthplace, and no, no, his where he was brought up. The Mukherjee, uh, uh, not Mukherjee. Uh, the what were their names? The um, 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 Mullocks. The Mullock House. Um, and uh, across the street from the Mullock House is the Radha Govinda Temple. It's still there. You go through a little archway. And it's a simple temple with a, three altars, which Prabhupada instituted it first time in Los Angeles, three altars. And now, of course, well, not he, well you, still you have three altars. Uh, and if you go there, I'll let you in on a secret. If you go to the, the Mullock Temple, family temple, on Mahatma Gandhi Road, at around seven in the morning, you can just go in and sit down, and they have uh, collapsible gates, but they don't have any curtain, and you can watch the Pujari bathe Radha Govinda and dress them, and they're beautiful deities, about this high uh, metal ostradot. And uh, he lets you just sit there, right up next to the gate. Did Prabhupada show you these places himself? Yeah, uh, pra Prabhupada did a five-day program there where he spoke every night. Mm. And <clears throat> along one wall, there's a courtyard, and there's a, a, a wall with some rooms, which he later had us do in Mayapur. So, oh, this is a good story. You'll like this, because it involves me. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Prabhupada would sit there after his class. He would sit in one of the rooms behind the low desk. And the whole Mullock family, very aristocratic, very aristocratic, wealthy Bengali family, his relatives, they would come in. And so all these uh, Bengali women, you know, different women, uh, different parts of India, the women wear their saris, different style. The, uh, uh, there's the Bollywood style, you know, down to here and up to here, but that we won't, you know. But in Bengal, the women are very, the, the way they wear their saris is very modest. And all these women came in, Prabhupada's nieces and nephews and 
friends, and they were very beautiful. They were wearing all these elaborate Barnasi saris and had jewels and you know necklace pearls and really decked out. I mean decked out. So after they all came and they promised, so Babanand, what do you think? I said, oh, the women are very beautiful, Prabhupada. He said, yes. He said, they have all the symptoms of beauty in a woman. I said, what is that, Prabhupada? He said, he went like this, he said, cat eyes. <laughs> and a space between their front teeth. Mm. He said, the symptoms of beauty in a woman. <laughs> and I said, what are the symptoms of beauty in a man, Prabhupada? <laughs> And he said, like you. Oh. <laughs> he, said, he said, strong and reddish complexion. He said, that indicates a strong heart. He said, you look like Arjun. <laughs> And he said, you are the most handsome man in ISKCON. Oh! <laughs> <Haribo>! <laughs> so now let's talk about the false ego. Huh? <laughs> Prabhupada just shaped us. He didn't try to change us. No. It's impossible to change what is eternal in a person. We all have traits and special, special characteristics that are different than everybody else. And Prabhupada could read that immediately and assign um, a job or a service for you that fitted your, molded your personality. But often it, was, it seemed like it was the opposite of what you really wanted to do like sending you to Mayapur. You wanted to go there, right? You didn't no, know. No, I wanted to go to India. Ma but, I didn't even know where Mayapur but was. But what was your impression when you first came? Well, uh, one night I was sleeping under a mosquito net, which was something new for me, <laughs> mosquito net, on, the, on, the, on what they call the Bajan Kutir, which we call the straw hut. The straw hut. <laughs> on the front little porch. And, and I got up in the middle of the night and there was this zzz, zzz, you know, some gotten inside the net, you know, that could drive you mad. So I went out in the fields. Now, if you've ever been to Mayapur, now along the road there's trees and there's buildings. And, but there was nothing there then, nothing, nothing. Just flat rice fields and one thorn tree, <laughs> and along the Bhakti Siddhanta road there was nothing, no trees, or one tree. But that's all. A swamp, basically. Huh? It was a swamp, a mosquito breeding ground. Yeah, it was, yeah. And I went out into the middle of the fields, and I looked up at the sky and I said, what in God's name am I doing here? <laughs> this is what I said to myself. I'm a sophisticated <laughs> New York man from New York, and here am I in the middle of a rice field in Bengal. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what I was saying to myself. At the peak of my life, my middle years. And my beauty. <laughs> Wasted. Well, then I said, well, Prabhupada wants me to build a city. So that's why I'm here. I might as well get on with it. And that was it. I remember that hut. We came there and there was, what did we have? Two acres of land, four acres? Uh, uh, nine. Bigas. Nine bigas. So that's uh, three acres. Three acres. That was it. Yeah. And uh, it looked like, like you described, just a desert of, of vegetation and water. We didn't think 
I mean, I didn't think at the time we'd be able to get, everyone thought maybe we won't get more land because the Muslim farmers around us did, really didn't want to sell for a, a cheap price. They wanted huge prices. And so you guys built that hut. We came there. And the first night, you were there, Brahmananda, all of the big sannyasis in India came because Prabhupada said we were going to build a cornerstone. We're going to put in a cornerstone and lay down the the cornerstone for this magnificent temple. We couldn't see it yet. But you guys started assign people to start digging a hole. It was 15 feet by, I think it was one meter or something wide each side. And all we had was one straw hut. So all of you big men, the first night, everyone was so happy to see Prabhupada again. Prabhupada invited you all to sleep in the hut with him at, that night. So. It was a small place, and, and you filled up the whole hut, all you sleeping men under your chowdas on the straw mat, maybe 20 men. And the next morning when we got up, Prabhupada said, tonight you will all sleep on the porch. You are all snoring. Yes. <laughs> your you nose kept, is you working. You kept me is. awake all night. He said, but Shamasundar may sleep, he does not snore. <laughs> <laughs> he watched us sleeping. <laughs> so I slept at the base of right below his bed and in the middle of the night I heard the same thing he was under a mosquito net like that after a while I heard Shama Sundar come up here so I got up on the, I opened the mosquito net yes Prabhupada he said there's one mosquito in here kill it <laughs> So I got, Prabhupada didn't get out of the bed. He st I got up in the bed with him and, you know, kind of tried to work around him as this mosquito was flying around. And he held the flashlight. He, he, he tried to find it. Ah, there it is. I, I nailed it. <laughs> now some of you may think, oh, what is this? The Swamiji is killing uh, an insect when it says they don't even, won't even harm an ant. But Prabhupada had, because of the same, same kind of story, in Brindaban, we would hang up a mosquito net over his desk. So when he translated, he'd be under the mosquito net. And someone, I think it was Tamal, heard <laughs> Prabhupada was killing the mosquitoes that had gotten in. And he said, don't mind, he said, you can kill them, he said, because they are attacking with a pointed weapon. Mm. So according to the Shastra, you can kill anyone who attacks you with a pointed weapon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he explained a little more on that one morning walk. He said that any, a Vaishnava rejoices when a, when a scorpion or a poisonous yeah. snake is killed because it releases him to a better body, it releases him from that venomous body. That was the word he used. Mm. Yes. Mm. In uh, Prabhupada always fulfilled desire mm. of ours. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've Every experienced desire. that. It was 1975. I was in uh, uh, Radhanath Maharaj asked me to re relate this story because it's the beginning of the book marathon. Mm. I was uh, visiting L.A. from Mayapur and Calcutta, and I was staying in an apartment just opposite the uh, temple. And everyone had gone out to Hollywood Boulevard to chant. It was dusk, and the, the evening star was there. It was beautiful. You know? And I was very, oh, gee, I'd love, I'd love to go up and see Prabhupada, but I you know, don't want to. And then suddenly Upendra came out and he saw me standing in the window and he said, Prabhupada wants to see you. Mm. So I, whoom, I was up those stairs, saying there Prabhupada asked me, sitting on his asana with the, the big bolster pillows and had big tassels on the end. And he was playing with the tassel, you know, on his finger. And he said, how is Mayapur? He wanted to know how all the devotees were what was going on, what, how was the work going. And uh, then he said, you, you 
did these rooms for me. I said, yes, Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. He said, yes. He said, I was thinking, what is the difference between the Goswamis and me? Mm -hmm. He said, they had their books, I have my books. They had their light. I had, and he pointed to a little chandelier. He said, I have my light. He said, every night they sat under a different tree. He said, if I want, every night I can stay in a different palace. Mm. He said, so what is the difference? Mm. He said, I used to visit my Guru Maharaj at the Chaitanya Mat in Mayapur. And he said, I didn't like, like it too much because... I had to sleep with all the brahmacharis on the wooden chokis and there was noise and it, probably, he wasn't comfortable. Then he's, he looked at me and Upendra was sitting over there and he looked at me and he said, it was horrible. He said, it's just like I did not want to come here. It is a horrible place. I did not want to come. But Krishna said, no, you come down and write those books. I will take care of everything. Mm. He said, but I did not want to go. I said, no, it is a horrible place. Mm. And Krishna said again, no, don't worry. I will take care of everything. You come down and write those books. We were stunned. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I had ever heard Prabhupada refer to himself as a resident of the spiritual mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. and his purpose in coming. Mm -hmm. His purpose in coming. I had a god brother uh, last week ask me, do you think Prabhupada knew he would be this successful when he was on the boat and coming on the Jaladu. I said, no, he didn't. He said, but, but you know, uh, he had Krishna and he was doing his Guru Maharaj, is following his order. I said, yes. I said, he knew that Krishna consciousness would be spread in the West because his spiritual master wanted it, but he didn't know that he was necessarily the one that would do it. Mm. I said, when he writes in his poetry, that poem that he wrote on the Jaladut, I'm just a humble beggar. I said, Prabhupada actually believed he was a humble beggar. Mm. I said, it wasn't some pretense. I said, when he had two heart attacks, on the Jaladut, it wasn't make-believe pain, mm. it was real pain. Mm. When he had the heart attack at 26 Second Avenue, that was real pain. Mm. It wasn't pretend, he wasn't pretending. He actually had to suffer. And I said, without suffering, there's no question of true victory. Mm. There has to be opposition, there has to be battle, in order to be triumphant. Otherwise, you're just make show. So Prabhupada didn't know. He didn't know what the, he said. Every day I went down to the Cindia steamship line to see when the ships are going back. I don't know how they will take, he writes in that poem, how will they take to Krishna consciousness? They're so covered by passion and ignorance. I don't know what will happen. So it's not that Prabhupada just came breezing in and you know everything was taken care of. Yes, Krishna took care of everything, but Prabhupada had to struggle. It's the struggle that's the, that makes the person great. Isn't it? Yes. The struggle. And he often said in that regard that if you 
suffer like this extreme to this extreme for Krishna attempt the impossible for Krishna that Krishna must come and help you he must personally intervene to remove the obstacles and Prabhupada himself was experiencing that in New York walking the streets he told me once uh, when we that time we arrived in Bombay from Nairobi do you remember that we opened our luggage and all the tape reels were gone all the philosophy tapes that we'd made in Nairobi over oh, yeah, six the, weeks yes. like from Plato up to Darwin what was nearly. that book called uh, the, the book became later yeah but we always it was only on tapes and that's beginning. right and they were all missing from the luggage and I said Prabhupada it looks like you know we've lost these Madhavisa went out and tried to track down through the airlines and so on we never saw them again I said Prabhupada we've just lost all the philosophy tapes it was two months work more than two months work daily work uh, I would be the Western philosopher he would debate that's right. That's right. And he'd defeat me every time. But these were precious tapes. And I reported to him that they were missing. What should we do? And he said, well, we'll start over again. And he told the story that when he got to New York, I think he was staying at the YMCA or something like that, he had spent years uh, on a manuscript typing it, a thick manuscript of Bhagavad Gita. And someone stole it. Somebody crawled over the doorway through the little transom window transom. and stole his meager belongings in New York, including that precious manuscript. There was no Xeroxing in those days or anything to copy anything. So it was gone forever. And he just said, okay, well, I'll do it again. This is the kind of struggles Prabhupada yeah. faced. And it's he funny. never backed down. Okay, we'll do it over again. <laughs> he was never defeated. Never defeated. I lived around the corner. But I never knew uh, at that time. Yeah. He was staying, it was a little office on 72nd Street and Broadway. Uh, that had the transom. Near, uh, he thought that the superintendent stole it. Oh, that's right. He was, he was I remember he accused him. And I was that. living around the corner in Central Park <laughs> West and... 73rd Street, Amsterdam. but I never had the good fortune. Near Needle, Needle Park there? Huh? Near Needle Park? Needle. Needle Park, they called it, the little... No, right opposite the Dakota. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not Needle Park, that's Broadway. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, Prabhupada. Well, does anyone have any questions? You must mm. be very hungry, but we'll take questions <laughs> the heckle and jekyll show <laughs> heckle and jekyll but don't forget Prabhupada did it for all of us all of us what he did that's if we can do anything else but instill if we do nothing else but instill that idea that realization in someone's head then our lives have been successful mm. and I think the spirit that we absorbed the most was to try to please our spiritual master that's all we lived for to, to see the pleasure that Prabhupada had from any service that we did and if if everyone adopts that attitude no matter uh, who your spiritual master is the the, the chain from Krishna to you goes through your spiritual master. Our spiritual master was Prabhupada. You have other spiritual masters. You try to serve them and get their attention. Try to get the, the attention of your guru from your service. Whoever accomplishes this or that, the guru is very pleased. If you want to get Krishna, you have to get your guru first. This is the secret. Jeez, we were competitive. Oh! We, walk, we crawled over each other, stabbed each other in the back to, to get Prabhupada's attention. <laughs> you, Prabhupada told me in Calcutta, someone was complaining, Prabhupada, everyone's so competitive. Prabhupada said, competition is good. <laughs> he said, when I was a boy, my brothers and sisters and I used to compete for the attention and love of our parents. Uh. And he said, in Goloka, 
the cowherd boys, they race each other to compete to see who can touch Krishna first. Mm -hmm. He said, so competition is good. Yeah. You used the food to attract all those devotees to New York. That's how you, you yeah. know, defeated your god brothers. Yeah. I did the same thing with Soundly. I did the same thing with George Harrison. I was a friend of a beetle in London. So I could go around India and poach Tamal Krishna's best men. I could say, Hey, listen, you gotta come up to London. Forget about Calcutta, Delhi. Come up to London and serve. That's you know, that's where the Beatles are. You'll get to hang the out. Magic but, word. Yeah. The Beatles. So Pro, Tamal would always run to Prabhupada or send him a letter. Shama is poaching my men again. <laughs> and Prabhupada said to him, That is your fault. If you cannot keep them, Shama Sundar is all right, doing the right thing. <laughs> so keep that spirit, you know. Try to get your guru's attention with your service. This will bring you close. There's a lady with a question. I'm staying at Malabar Hill, but I went all the way when he was living, Prabhupaji, to Juhu Temple, and the shishyas, the foreigners, they introduced me to Prabhupaji. I said, I want to meet Prabhupaji. I want to join uh, Hare Krishna movement. I want to stay here. Yes. So he was meditating around 8 or 39, and all his foreigners' friends were also meditating. And I met Prabhupaji, and you know what he told me? go back to your house because a girl lives under the guidance, under the shelter of the father, husband and son. And they called up my mother and they sent me back. <laughs> this is my experience with Prabhupada uh, you have a story like that? Do I have a story like that? Like that? Do you? Pra Prabhupada protecting the ladies. In that uh, yes, he told the story of his sister Pishima. When she was married, she married a very bad man. It was a bad match. <laughs> he was a, a drunkard and he ate fish and he didn't treat her nicely at all. So she went to Prabhupada what should I do? Should I leave him? Should... Prabhupada said, no, don't leave. He said, remember those deities that you and I played with when we were children, little Radha Krishna deities. He said, do you have them? She said, yes. He said, he said get them out and start to worship them. Mm. So she started worshiping these deities and by the intensity of her worship, she didn't leave her husband. She was submissive, but she added an intense, deep worship of her deities. And in the end result was, her husband was so moved by her devotion mm. that he came to worship her. Yes, Prabhupada was very concerned about our, our parents and our, our friends. He always took care of, whenever a devotee's parents would come, he would treat them royally. Yeah. One, there was one boy uh, who had come to our very place temple, a very young boy, 16 years old. And he was from a Pakistani family, Muslim family. And he start, started staying with us, and his parents became very upset. They lived in another town, I believe, in northern England. And Prabhupada, he came. Prabhupada came. To, uh, he came to Prabhupada and said, "What should I do? You know, I, my parents are meat eaters. They're Muslims. I, I want to stay with you people." So Prabhupada called his parents on the phone and requested that they allow his son to stay with him. <laughs> and the father agreed. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How could you deny problem? Yeah, he was so charming. Mm. I mean, he could charm anyone. Uh, is there some questions you want to... Uh. 
50 years ago, uh, Prabhupada came to US by ship, cargo ship. But in this era of planes, flights, why did Prabhupada chose a cargo ship? Means it was a Krishna's Leela or Mercy, we can say, or it, it was a pastime of Prabhupada to to go to US by a cargo ship in in era of uh, flights. Did you understand a word you I said? I didn't quite. No, I didn't understand a word you said. Can no, something about yeah. going to America. Why didn't Prabhupada go on the plane? There were no planes in those days. There were planes, but he didn't have the money. Yeah. Sumati Maharaji arranged passage for him on the Jaladut. He had no money. He had what? 20 rupees. 20 rupees. You can't get on a plane for 20 rupees, and there's no direct flights. In those days, there were maybe one or two flights a week, yeah. inter international flights. Yeah. No one traveled by plane yet. This was 1965. I have a plane story. Okay. Do you, re you were there. The first airport in Calcutta. It was like a, a, an air... Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. Yeah. They're little... Propeller little, planes. And propeller planes. And Prabhupada was leaving in 1972, and he was sitting. Of course, at that time, you could just walk out on the runway. You could walk Prabhupada to the, up to the stairs. <laughs> there was no security. Before Dum Dum, you're talking, small airport. It was Dum Dum Airport. Oh, okay. And the first one. And it, and it had wooden benches. And Prabhupada was sitting on the wooden benches and I was sitting next to him. And he was looking at all the people walking by. And he said, from my angle of vision, these are all, what do you call walking dead people? So I said, zombies, Prabhupada? He said, yes, <laughs> zombie. <laughs> That they are all zombie, walking dead. <laughs> walking dead, yes. He used to say that in 100 years, no one on this planet will be here. In 100 years from now. And it gave you the idea, too, that we're all just walking zombies. We inhabit this little space. But we fight to we remain. Fight. <laughs> so foolish. All right. Sri the Prabhupada Ki! Jai! 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 Sri the Prabhupada Ki!